So let's make some speed. John chapter 1 and verse 17. This is in continuation with our message last week on the law, on the grace. John 1 and 17, and my message for today is on the law and on the grace. You could reverse it and say on the grace, on the law, same thing. Amen? But let's read John 1 and 17 out loud together. After 2, let's go 1 and 2. For, For the, the law, law was given, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Let's do it one more time. For, For the, the law was, was given by Moses, Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why am I even teaching this? Why? Because our salvation depends on law and grace. Remember Jesus said, I am not come to destroy the law. I am not come to abolish the law. I haven't come to do away with the law. In that same breath, Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no wise, no means, enter into the kingdom of heaven. So our salvation is dependent on our understanding of law and grace. Amen? Amen. A rich man once asked Jesus, Good master, how can I inherit eternal life? Remember, eternal life is a type of life. It is the God type of life. It is the Zoe type of life. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, everything whole. And eternal life is the life that you spend in heaven. Everybody will have everlasting life. But not everybody will have eternal life. Eternal life goes to heaven. And if you don't have eternal life, you will have everlasting life but in hell. So this man was asking Jesus, how do I get to heaven with eternal life? And Jesus sent him to the law. He said, you know the commandments, go keep the law. Jesus did not tell him, show him the grace lane or the grace road or the grace highway. He showed him the law highway. Amen? Amen. Nowadays, preachers are showing you the grace highway. Be careful. Unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you are not going to heaven. So be mindful. Amen? Now you got to remember the Pharisees were very religious people, but they lacked righteousness. Righteousness simply means right standing with God. Right standing with God means to believe and to latch on to his word. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham latched to, the, latched to the word of God so strong that it was credited to his account for righteousness. Amen? Amen. To love God means you have to love his word. Nowadays, the word of God is secondary to Christians. They say they love God. But they don't love his word. How can you love God and not love his word? Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you say you love me. If you go to church and you say, I love you, Jesus. Ooh, oh, my God. I love you. What? I don't even know how to sing that song anymore. I worship and adore you. Oh, so kuruba ba 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 karaba. Oh, just want to tell you <laughs> that I love you more than anything. Jesus says, "Shut your mouth and keep my commandments." That's how I know you love me. You don't show you love him by singing Hallelujah. a nice song. Keep my commandments. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. But you can only keep the commandments if you know the commandments. If you don't know the commandments, you cannot keep them. That's why power of Christ exists to teach and to preach 
the Bible as the authoritative word of God to give you an option to keep or not to keep his commandments. God has given you a choice. He is giving you a choice to do or not to do. He's not forcing the commandments down your throat. But at least you have people like us who will bring you the word and you choose to keep it or not. Yes. And if you keep it, when you die, God would give you angels and they would escort you to his glory into heaven. Amen. But if you fail to keep his commandments also, when you die, he will also give you angels to escort you straight to hell with siren. Amen? And when you get to hell, they'll look out. Who? I hear the siren. Who are they dropping off? Say, wow, now man counsel. Who? Come in. They'll welcome you. So God does not interfere with your choice. That's why we exist. Amen? Yes. We're not here to give you a performance. We're not here to sweet talk you. We're not here to preach what other people are preaching, to be in trend with the, what's going on. We're here to bring you Bible. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. 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 So, John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, this is, the one, this is one of the scriptures that the grace preachers are using to propagate that we are no longer on the law and on the grace. Now, please help me understand. Maybe I can't read and understand properly. Let's have that scripture on the screen. Let's read it again, and I'm going to ask you some important questions. And just, maybe it's just me. I want you to help me answer this question. Amen? John 1 and 17. Let's read it. For the, For the law, law was given by Moses, by Moses but, but grace and truth came, came by Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, after reading this scripture, let me ask you something. Be very honest with yourself. Where in this scripture does it say the law is abolished? Where? Where in this scripture does it say grace took the place of the law? It doesn't say so. Where in this scripture does it say that law was a dispensation? And where in the scripture does it say that grace is now the new dispensation? Nowhere. How did grace and truth got rid of the law? It doesn't say that. The scripture doesn't say that. But if you tune on the television, you hear preachers beating up the scripture and trying to indoctrinate you that grace now took the place of the law. That's why God also put us on television to also reach millions of homes to reverse this truth. Even though some people might not think we are relevant, but God put us there for a reason. Let me tell you what I understand from the scripture. We're going to read it again, and then we're going to read my understanding on the scripture. And see if you can accept it. It is a suggestion. So let's have John 1.17 on the screen again. Hallelujah. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now this is what I understand. For the law was given by Moses, but Jesus applied grace and truth for the forgiveness of our sins when we transgress the law. That is exactly what that scripture said. Remember, Jesus had already said, I have not come to destroy the law. So why would this scripture contradict that one? There is no contradiction in the Bible. Not unless you want to create one. For the law was given by Moses, but Jesus applied grace for the forgiveness when we transgress the law. Remember, sin is violation of God's law, which was given by Moses. Amen? Amen. 
Now, from those of you who are from Sierra Leone, let me give you a better translation. See if this goes in. For the fufu was brought in by Olga, but Gloria came in with the sour sour. Does that mean we should not eat the fufu because the sour sour came? No. Does that mean the fufu is abolished because we now have sour sour? No. For the sour sour will help us process the fufu go down our throat easily. Amen. Just like grace will help us process our sin when we break the law. So we should not get rid of the fufu because sour sour came. God forbid. Amen. Amen. Now that's a scripture. What I just said about it, that's script, you, you don't believe? Okay. Romans 3.31. That scripture we just read. Romans 3.31. You'll see exactly what I just said. In the Bible. Let's read Romans 3 and 31 together aloud. After 2, 1 and 2. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Now this is Paul in the New Testament telling us Christians, do we abolish the law because of faith? He said, God forbid, Father forgive. If anything, we establish the law. To establish means to publicize the law, to preach the law, to promote the law. This is Paul telling us, no, we don't abolish the law because of grace or because of faith. If anything, he says, we publicize the law, we preach the law, we promote the law. Amen. I know at this point some of you might be thinking, but pastor, what about the letter to the Galatians and the letter to the Romans? Didn't Paul talk extensively about the fact that we are no longer under the law? No, he did not. We have been lied to by the hyper-grace preachers. Don't you think I've read the book of Galatians myself and Romans? Don't you think I've read those? We've been led astray by the nowadays Pharisees who hold fast to the doctrine called replacement theology. And please, when you have time, not, not even when you have time, please make time to study replacement theology replacement theology. If you love God, you'll do that. If you know you love God, just make that effort. Study about replacement theology. Replacement theology is a malignant tum tumor that affects the body of Christ. We need to cut that off. John 1, 17 again says, For grace and truth was given by Moses. I mean, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's John 1, 17. Replacement theology tells us that there was a time when we were under the dispensation of the law. But right now, after Christ, we are under a new dispensation called grace. And we've been hearing that so long for so long, and we believe it. And we believe that because that's what they've been telling us. They've programmed us. They've programmed us to believe that, you know, under Christ, we are under this dispensation of grace. But under the law, we were under, the, under Moses, we were under the dispensation of the law. So, dispensationalism is a section under replacement theology. Now, let me ask you this. Think about it for a minute. Just think about it. That, you know, under Moses, everybody was under the law. And under Jesus, everybody is now under grace. Think about it. God gave you a brain to think. So, let's think, right? So, if those people under Moses were under the law... They did not have grace. Woo! They all just went to hell because they did not have grace to forgive their sins. They went straight to hell because they did not have grace. How unfair can God be? 
And now, we are not under the law. We are under our no obligation to keep the law. But we are all going to heaven because we have grace. Wow. Did you ever process it like that? That God would choose a set of people before Christ and send them all to hell because there was no grace for them. And we can now sin as much as we want and we can just have grace and go to heaven. Dispensationalism is from hell. So in other words, the people who needed grace, who were under the law, did not have grace. But we who don't need grace, we have grace. What kind of sense does that make? We say it in Creole, get get no want, want want no get. In other words, the one who wants grace don't have grace, but the ones who don't need grace, they have grace. We don't need grace because we are not under the law. We don't need grace to forgive our sins, yet we have grace. But the ones who are under the law who need grace... They don't have grace. You're giving God a bad name. It's like praying this prayer. Some have food but cannot eat. Some can eat but have no food. But I thank God that we have the law and we have grace to forgive us when we violate the law. So, let's go back to Paul. You know, I hear this thing a lot about Paul. Paul. Paul said this in the book of Galatians. Paul said this in the book of Romans. Paul said this. Paul said that. Paul. Would it be nice to just invite Paul to this meeting right now and ask Paul, sit him down, and ask Paul, say, Paul, did you say we are no longer? That would be nice, right? I think it would be. Matter of fact, why don't we just do that? Let's call Paul. But I want you to pay attention because Paul is about to speak to you. You're going to hear from Paul right now. And after you hear from Paul, if you are stubborn enough to stick with just grace and abolish God's law, remember, you have a choice to choose. You choose life or you choose death. So Paul is about to speak to you. Paul is going to answer all your questions right now. Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, is going to answer this very question. Are you ready to meet Paul? Yeah. Let's bring in Paul, the apostle, Acts 21, 17 to 24. Act 21, 17 to 24. They are about to sit Paul down and ask Paul this very question of law and grace. And you are going to hear Paul for yourself. Funnily, this picture, this scripture has never been read by the great. They would not touch this scripture. If they are their way, they would tear this scripture out of the Bible and make sure it's never reprinted again. But thank God, we still have it. Are we ready? We're going to read it first, and then I'm going to come back and explain. Well, it is self-explanatory, but I'm going to come back and explain. So let's read Acts 21, 17 to 24. Let's read aloud. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, 
neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this, that we say to thee, We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know those things whereof that they were informed concerning thee, and nothing. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly, and keepest the law. Amen. Amen. So, Paul went up to Jerusalem to meet James, who was the bishop of the church. Now, James is Jesus' brother, John, Peter, and the rest of the apostle. They said, Paul, come here, sit down, sit down, sit down. We want to talk with you. We know that when Jesus was walking the earth, you were not with us. You were one of the Pharisees over there. We walked with Jesus. We've had rumors that you've been teaching people not to follow the law. You've been teaching the Jews not to follow the law. Now remember, he said, the Jews and not the Gentiles. But also remember in Acts chapter 15, when the Gentiles came into the faith, they gave them an instruction, a mandate. They said, you know, these people are the Gentiles. They were not with us in Judaism. So let us give them these things to keep. Let us tell them or write to them to abstain from pollution, to abstain from idol, to abstain from fornication, law, to not eat anything strangled, law, to, be a for, to abstain from blood, law. So they were telling the Gentiles to keep the law because all these things are written in the law. So the Gentiles are safe. And on top of that, they told the Gentiles they will learn more as they go in the synagogue every Saturday for Moses of all times and in every city, them that preach the law of Moses being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. So the Gentiles are expected to go to the synagogue every Sabbath day and understand and learn about the law of Moses. Now, the Gentiles were fine. But here, they're questioning Paul. Are you telling the Jews to forsake the law of Moses? Is that what you're doing, Paul? Paul said, me? When did I say so? Paul said, I never said so. They said, okay. Let, me, let us read this again. It says, verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified God and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, Paul, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and are zealous of the law. To be zealous means to put out great energy for the law, to be enthusiastic about the law. And now, Paul, this is what we hear, verse 21. And they are informed of thee, verse 21, that thou teachest all Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake the law. Paul, are you saying we are no longer under the law? Paul, is that what you're saying? We are no longer under the law? Paul, answer. This would have been a wonderful opportunity for Paul to say, you know, I don't think we're under the law anymore. We're under grace. If Paul really meant that, Paul would have said, Brethren, we are under grace and not under law. Right? This was Paul's platform to announce that we are no longer under law but under grace. Let's read verse 21 again. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all Jews which were among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs of the law. 
God forbid. Paul said, uh uh. Verse 24. They said, okay, to prove this, Paul, to prove that they are lying, take verse 24. Paul, help me read. Take them and purify thyselves with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things whereof they are informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Prove to us that you walk orderly and keep the law. Prove it, Paul. Prove it now, Paul. Prove to us that you keep the law. And verse 26. Then Paul took the man the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. What just happened here? Paul just demonstrated the Nazareth vow. Now, Christians don't know what the Nazareth vow is, but what Paul just did, Paul said, I'm not against the law. Matter of fact, let me prove it to you. And Paul went and observed the law. Don't you think that should have been the time when Paul should have said, oh, no, I can't do this because we are no longer under the law? Don't you think that should have been the time? But Paul says, no, let me prove it to you. Where are the people? Paul went in and kept the law. Amen. Amen. Did you catch that? Dispensationalism cannot be true. There was not a set time for law and then a set time for grace. Law and grace started at the same time. In the Garden of Eden, there was a law that Adam and Eve should not eat of a certain tree. They violated the law. Immediately, God killed an animal, applied grace for their transgression. Amen. So even in the Garden of the Eden, there was grace. Yes. Yes. Grace was present there for their sin. Yes. You say grace came by Jesus and grace came when? 2,000 years ago? So if, there, if grace came 2,000 years ago, how come there was grace in the Garden of Eden when they sinned? How come the Bible says, Noah found grace. There is no grace before law or law before grace. Grace and law came at the same time. Amen. So in the book of Genesis, there was always grace and law. Amen. Whenever they sinned in Genesis, they killed an animal for the forgiveness of the sin because without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. So God killed an animal just like in the Garden of Eden when he made coats out of skin for them. An animal was killed. You cannot have coats of skin without killing an animal. So right there, there was grace. So throughout Genesis, we see animal sacrifice representing Jesus. Animal sacrifice was there representing the blood of Christ. And in Exodus, we saw that in full display. You know where we say, I plead the blood of Jesus? Do you know where that came from? That came from Passover when they had to kill the sacrificial lamb and put it over their door post. What were they doing? They were pleading the blood of the sacrificial lamb, which was the blood of Jesus. And that was grace. And the Bible says, if I see the blood, I will pass over. That was grace. So grace was in Genesis. We just saw grace in Exodus. Or in Leviticus, there's plenty of grace. You don't want to touch Leviticus. Numbers, grace. 
Deuteronomy, grace. In the Old Testament, grace, 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 grace was all over the place. So how can dispensationalism be true when we found so much grace in the Old Testament? How can that be true? But if you latch on to that teaching, that teaching will take you straight down the highway to hell. He said, well, God understand. No, 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 no. God understand your understanding of the word. That's what God understand, your understanding of the word. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, you got to understand that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We know that. That's elementary. We know that. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. What is evidence? Evidence is proof. When you have evidence, you have proof, right? Well, what does proof do? Well, proof validates or substantiates something that you don't currently have at the moment. When you have proof, you are validating that you have something that you don't physically have right now. I have proof of my car. This is the title, but I don't have the car right here. But if I look, if you look at my title, this is proof. But when we see the car, we don't need the proof anymore because we have it. Amen? Amen. So the people in the Old Testament had proof of Jesus in the animal sacrifices. Even though they didn't see, physically see Jesus, they believe that faith is the substance or the evidence of things not seen. So they put their faith in the blood or animal sacrifice, which was a placeholder for Jesus. And when John the Baptist came, he said, this is the Lamb of God Amen. who takes the place now of all the animal sacrifices. So the people in the Old Testament had grace, just like we have grace, but now we are not using animal sacrifices. We are using the proof or the actual man himself. Same thing. They had grace. We have grace. We have the law, they are the law. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Acts 24 and 14. Let's all read it together aloud. Acts 24 and 14 says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law, and in the prophets. This is Paul again. Paul says, I worship God, believing all things which are written in the law and the Old Testament. So don't bother take me to the book of Galatians right now. Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, is telling you right here. He says, I, Paul, believed all things. He didn't say we put away all things. He said, I worship God like this. I worship God with the law. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. You know what that means? If you obey the law, you're not going to need the blood sacrifice because the sacrifice is there to forgive your sins, right? So to obey is better than sacrifice. So it is better to keep the law. Amen. So in other words, it's better to keep the law than to keep asking for grace. Amen. Why? Because to obey is better than sacrifice. Yes. But if you can't obey, then the sacrifice is available to you. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Paul says, this is how I worship God. I believe all things. Can we have that on the screen again? Act 24, 14. Paul says, believe in all things, not some of the things, not a few of the things which are written in the law. He says, all things. Does that sound like we've gotten rid of the law? No. We are under the law. 
we are also under grace when we miss the law. No, 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 seriously, can I kill you and face no consequence? I'm not under the law. I can, I'm lawless. I am a lawless man roaming about. So since I'm no longer any under the law, I, I can kill you, right? But there is a law that says, thou shalt not kill. Can you imagine if the United States of America said, we, the government of the people, are pleased to announce that we, the United States, are no longer any under law. Do whatever you want, and we will forgive you. <laughs> I wish, right? We, the, people, we, we, the United States, are no longer under any law. Don't obey any law. We're just going to give you grace. Whatever you do, just come to the courthouse and grace, grace. Matter of fact, collect all your grace at the beginning of the year. So whatever you do, just give them a receipt to have grace, 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 grace. That's what we're saying with God. If you don't think that makes sense with the United States of America, why should that make sense in the kingdom of God? In the United States of heaven, why should that make sense? I don't understand. And this was the very question Paul was asking in the book of Galatians. Who have bewitched you that you should believe any other doctrine or gospel, which is not another, but when we get to the book of Galatians, we'll get there and you'll see how twisted these people have been to convince us of dispensationalism, which is part of the agenda of replacement theology. You know, for you to get a, a, a divinity degree, you have to go to a university that teaches these things. And they give you a syllabus and they, they're teaching you, so they're telling you. They're programming you. And when you graduate, you got to teach it like they taught you. And so they come out of school now, seminary school. Some people call it cemetery school. They come and poison you, and you see them on television. You hold them in high esteem and high regard, and you just sit in there, gullible, swallowing. Not on the, yeah. On the, you just swallowing, swallowing whatever they're dishing out. No. No. Read your Bible. Amen? Amen. Yes. Let's read one more scripture and then we close. Well, we've already read the scripture. Romans 10 and 4. We are under law and we are under grace. Amen. We are under law and we are under grace. You know, I, it, <laughs> this just came to my mind. You remember when they took the Ten Commandments down, the courthouse and the schools? You remember that? And Christians were outraged. How can they do that? They took our Ten Commandments off the schools and off. That's hypocrisy. You should have been happy. You should have been said, thank God. It's about time because we are no longer on the law but on the grace. Why are you trying to defend something that you say you're no longer on the? Why? And another thing, Christians say we are no longer on the law, right? Have you listened to Christian pray? No, seriously. A Christian that tells you we are no longer on the law but on the grace, go listen to them pray. You know what they pray? In the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No we Isn't that Old Testament? I thought you said we are no longer under the Old Testament. Why are you praying? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. How do you expect that to work? I thought you said we are no longer under that anymore. And you pray like this. You know, Psalm, Psalm 91. He that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And you zoom down, a thousand shall fall by... You want the thousands of fall, but you just said you're no longer under love or under grace. 